I'm uh, extremely happy to be back uh, with all of you here at our uh, now monthly uh, IBA stage events. And uh, um, in particular, I'm happy because we are rejoining Liverpool Biennial, which was uh, actually the first IBA stage that we ever did as IBA. Uh, so for us, it's a, it's a very nice welcome uh, to the to our uh, uh, long-term uh, friends on Mercy sites, uh, which is, uh, it's great to be back. <coughs> um, I'll quickly introduce the whole series for those uh, uh, that are less familiar with IBA Stage. Um, it's a series of online events uh, uh, in which invited biennials have a chance to deliver a presentation uh, of, their more of their most recent project. Uh, the series was uh, envisioned and developed uh, uh, very much as a response uh, to the impossibility of traveling during uh, uh, the height of the COVID uh, pandemic, but we kept it as part of our public program as, uh, as we thought it would be, uh, it would continue to be a, a great tool to create uh, uh, a lasting archive on the one hand of biennials across the world narrated by biennial makers. Um, and also because we thought it gave biennial, biennials an additional stage, um, pardon the pun, uh, to, uh, to face questions by, by an audience, by, uh, by peers, and uh, uh, hopefully to yeah, say a bit more about the story behind a specific project. <coughs> Before introducing our two guests uh, today, I just want to give uh, very few house rules uh, for the Zoom. Um, and I want to start by reminding everyone that the event is uh, being recorded and also streamed through our social media outlets. Um, and uh, which leads me to uh, also wanting to thank and welcome those of you uh, that are following us through other channels than our direct Zoom. <coughs> uh, as quick rules, there are the usual ones. We, we've quite familiarized ourselves with the, with the medium, but just as a reminder, please keep your microphone and camera off during the presentation. Uh, feel free, of course, to open uh, your your video during the Q and A, which will follow the presentation itself. Uh, and in case you want to ask a question, you can either raise your hands through the Zoom button. I don't know how else to describe that, uh, or write it on our chat. Uh, if you raise your hands, of course, we will give you the word, and you, you're free to open uh, the mic to to ask your, the the question directly. If you have any um, any other comments not related to this uh, or any question to IBA, not related to this specific event, but maybe for future events and so on, uh, please do uh, reach out to us at info at bainiaassociation.org. Thank you for the patience for these uh, couple of minutes of uh, um, taking care of our own things. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to warmly wel welcome uh, our two guests, uh, Kanisile Mbongwa uh, and uh, Sam Lucky, uh, who are joining us together, uh, which is great, uh, from, from Liverpool, where uh, they just opened uh, the 2023 uh, Liverpool Biennial at the beginning of this month. <clears throat> and I hope, of course, many of, uh, of you in the audience uh, will have a chance of uh, witnessing the exhibition also firsthand. Kanisle Mbongwa is a Cape Town-based independent curator, uh, award-winning artist and sociologist who engages with her curatorial practice as uh, uh, curing and care, using the creative uh, to instigate spaces uh, for, em for emancipatory practices, joy and play. Mbongwa uh, is the curator of uh, uh, Puncture Points, uh, founding member and curator of 20 Journey, uh, and former executive director of uh, Handspring Trust Puppets. This is an extract of a much longer uh, trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've not said that. <laughs> 
um, and uh, joining us as well. And of course, she's the curator of uh, uh, Umoya, the Sacred Return uh, of Lost Things, uh, as the uh, 2023 Liverpool Biennial uh, was titled. Joining us also uh, from the same office in Liverpool is uh, Sam Lackey, who is um, who was head of collections and exhibition at Whitworth, uh, uh, where she was senior le uh, lead uh, of the leadership team. Previously, she was curator at the Hepsworth uh, Wakefield. Uh, and uh, she is also a board member of IBA, uh, which is, uh, uh, yeah, another definitely important thing, at least for us. <laughs> uh, and she has been uh, uh, heading the Liverpool Biennial uh, for the last uh, three years. Uh, I remember we were talking in the previous occasion and uh, it was a very fresh appointment. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing also uh, how that changed and how the encounter with the city developed in the last uh, two years since our last uh, discussion here at WA stage. Without further ado, I uh, would like to give you the floor uh, and uh, uh, we will catch up uh, afterwards with the Q&A uh, after your presentation. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you for agreeing for this uh, to this presentation and uh, I look forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to start by saying thank you to Christian and to Jennifer and to the IBA for inviting us to come and present our biennial again. I had, um, well, for the first time, I had forgotten that Liverpool Biennial was the first in the series. Um, so thank you for reminding me, Christian, because I guess, um, as you've alluded to, what really feels very different is for that last presentation, uh, the curator and I I think when we gave our presentation to IBA, not only were we not in the same room, I don't think we were in the same city. Mm. So um, it's like, a, it's basically a huge pleasure to be sitting next to our curator for this biennial, Canisile, and to have been able to work in a different way for this biennial. I'm going to hand over to her now to talk us through the biennial. I'll play a part in that and we're open to questions at the end I think would be our preference but if there are things that pop into your head that you want to note down in the comments do that as you go along and we can always respond to those at the end yeah, yeah which would be great um, but thank you all for joining us it's lovely to see some friends and familiar um, well not faces because we can't see your faces but familiar, familiar names, names. <laughs> looking back at us through the screen. So yeah, we hope to welcome you that we haven't seen in person to the biennial very soon. Okay, over to you. Can I see what I need to share? Cool. Um, since this is, you know, um, my first time being here, thank you for the invites to IBA. Uh, thank you for being curious and interested to see what we have done here. And thank you for the people who are you know, logging in to hear me say a few things about this biannual. Um, yeah, I think we must go to the next slide. So as you know, um, the biannual is titled Umoya, the Sacred Return of Lost Things. And um, which, which, you know, Umoya, the word Umoya mean is from a Sisulu, is an Sisulu word from my mother tongue one of my mother tongues, which means wind, breath, air, spirit, soul, and temperament. And it was quite important for me to, to think about language and the intimacy of language and mother tongues and how so many people have lost their mother tongues because of the violence of colonialism and, and enslavement and how these histories continue to plague our, our time right now or carry a particular legacy. And one of those legacies is through language and how we get to articulate ourselves. For instance, I'm speaking in English, which is one of the languages, <clears throat> um, a remnant of sort of colonial and enslavement brutality. But of course I have this intimate relationship with uh, the English language because it's the lang one of the languages in which I'm socialized in. 
and educated in and um, introduced to so many worlds through the English language. And so it was important for me to think about um, the, the, the title, the concept, the provocation, the invitation in communication with my mother tongue, given that I am a black African queer woman. And so just to make a note on that, uh, cause I feel like the, the, the title is quite important to me and it's quite important how it was delivered because it was a delivery and a gift from the ancestral and spiritual. It is not something I sat down and thought about. Um, I was standing at the docks this one day uh, here in Liverpool and um, dressed very warmly, thermal vest, everything, but the, the current um, of the wind and its temperament and its temperature hit my bones in such a way, like traveled through all those layers of clothing that I had and hit my bones in such a way that I started having this dialogue with the wind itself and asking it like pertinent questions around its involvement um, in the transatlantic slave trade, in its involvement in the colonial um, expedition, its involvement in building the empire in, in the British context. And so the title then was given to me in the, during that moment because I had this vision where the wind opened up the, the ocean and all these souls and spirits were returning home. And so this is what then becomes the title. And I was having this conversation with Sam yesterday about how the title actually that is in English is a translation from the title that I was actually given, which was Umoya you know, like a, a returning home. But obviously this is not a direct translation. I had to find, you know, to work again intimately with the language to find a, a sound way to hold, to hold that. Um, and also because I think this title um, invitation provocation came also because of the conversations happening um, in the world, but particularly in the art world around reparations and repatriation and the returning of, of um, objects. But the concern I also have here is, you know, how do we return, you know, the beings, the people, the spirits, the souls that were lost during the, the this violent transportation across the ocean, but also during the enslaved labor in plantations and different forms of plantations. Um, yeah, I think I've said enough about the title. Um, and so maybe before I even go into Raisa, into the artists that we're going to sort of be touching on, to sort of speak a little bit about um, the formation of the selection of these artists. So when I was thinking about the biennial, I was thinking about how does one ground um, a biennial when there's so there's multiple venues and all these venues sit in different ways like there are partner venues that we work with we've been working the biennial has been working with for a long time over the 25 years and then there are venues that are what what the biennial calls found venues and for me these are some of the venues that I find very interesting because they are either these derelict buildings or these buildings that hold um uh, fascinating histories around the, the architecture and imagination and, and the building of what we know as Liverpool City. And so I thought about how does one um, hold that space in the specific venues? And I thought about grounding artists, having an artist in each venue that grounds the entire exhibition. And so in each venue, we have an artist that not only is showing their work, but their work is a way to sort of make sense of the space, make sense of the lineage of the space, the history of the space, but also holds in a way the works, the other works of the other artists um, and works alongside and through and with that work. And so here we will start with um, Raisa, Raisa Kabir's work who is at the Blue Coat and which for Raisa, the title of the work, of the entire work is called Utterances, Our Vessels for the Stories Unspoken, Sabiquous Violence, Sea, Ocean, which is a work from 2016 to present. And here I also wanted to, with Raisa's work, it, I wanted to do a retrospective. I wanted to see how does a retrospective or a survey of an artist's work um, function in a biannual context. And 
And so what we see here um, is an engagement of the writers' work over the 10 years or so, and also these new works that come, um, which Riza explores this sort of global intertwined histories of cotton, of silk, of jute, of indigo and flax, and how these histories of extractions, economies of indentured labor and enslaved labor, maritime boats, merchant trade, cargo moving in and out of the Liverpool docks. In a way, Risa traces and keeps record and calls on the lost ancestors that move through these routes or routes of material trade, mapping out the threads that link us to the water, to the land, to the geographies, and also to one another. Um, I always think of Risa's work as the warp of the loom this idea of weaving time and stories together because, you know, Risa works a lot with, with her hands and, and threads and cotton and how um, in, in our conversations, she spoke of the value of labor, the value of the thread um, in indigenous cotton production and the queerness of the cloth. And I think within the blue coat, um, within Blue Coat, where we also have works by Benoit Perrault, and we also have works by Kent Chan, the idea of Blue Coat was to, to think about these histories of extractions, but also to think about museum practices, to think about um, uh, labor, like artist labor and how they produce and the kind of labor that sits in the bodies, but to also think about bodies that live with disabilities, invisible disabilities as well, and how they make sense of that. But also to think about play and love and intimacy and desire. And so between, between um, Risa's work and Benoit, Benoit Pinro's work, we get to see this sort of um, uh, childlike intimacy fantasy, particularly in Benoit's work and play and the history of that when one is dealing with the, the body and an ailing body, a body that is ailing over time by living with the different disabilities. And of course, in Ken Chan's work, we're looking at um, museum practices and specifically looking at the, uh, the, archive, the archive in the museum and what it means for the tropics and heat. I won't go into further detail into that, but sort of to just give you a, an idea of what's sitting in Blue Coat and one other word that is there, is a work by um, Nicholas Galanin and it's a video piece, um, which is a beautiful video piece of him speaking in Tingland, his, um, his mother tongue to his son, um, giving um, affirmation um, messages of love and care and just holding, holding that space of a child making sense of themselves uh, through their mother tongue. Okay. And then the other grounding artist um, is at Cotton Exchange. Do you want to say something? Okay. <laughs> um, the other grounding artist is Sebide Raha at Cotton Exchange. Um, and Sebide's work, um, which is uh, Songs to Earth and Songs to Seeds, which is a, is a film or a short film uh, which was made last year, engages with the histories of labor, indigenous rice cultivation, the passing down of knowledge in her family for almost um, a century, and also looking at harvest season and the feminine or nurturing process the women bring into the processes of labor, alongside really investigating and exploring and um, a critical, more like a critical conversation of what industrialization and global politics does to these kind of structures and industries and how the disruption, for instance, of the US attacking Iran also meant forcing a shift into this genetic, genetically modified um, grain. And, and so for me, um, Sepita's work is, is, um, is, how can I say, it's like, it's an important work because it talks about this intergenerational resistance to maintaining um, the family grain for almost two generations in a state of duress. And this is quite important, this sort of resistance seen as this intergenerational conversation seen, you know, through this grain of rice, but also like what this grain of rice represents within Northern Iran, within 
um, Sepita's family within the women in, in that particular region and how this labor by women is also a form of resistance. You know, women tend to um, form, form this invisible labor. Um, this, and, and in this context, you know, this sort of indigenous engagement of knowledge, of seeding, of cultivation. And also one of the interesting things that um, Sebida mentioned to me that I wasn't aware is that this whole process takes nine months. So there's this idea of like birthing, you know, coming into having not only birthing, but like planting, seeding, watering, tending to, attending, but also in this very in, indigenous process, like which survives in a way, you know, it's quite fascinating to see the survival of indigenous practices that are passed down that survive industrialization. And so this theme of resistance is what holds cotton exchange together between the works of Shannon um, Alonso and the works of Lungiswa Punta, which also looks at forms of resistance from a Caribbean context and an African context. And this I think this is, um, and because Cotton Exchange as a site is one of the found venues that has this history of, um, of economy, you know, like trading of cotton and trading of other forms of um, uh, materials that have been extracted from the different um, colonies and sort of this uh, reduction of bodies, black bodies and brown bodies into bodies of labor. And then this sort of economic, economical exchange and that the site, you know, is an important site to think about resistance, but particularly to think about resistance from the perspective of women and queerness. And that resistance is also a form of imagining one into existence. Um, and then the next grounding artist we have is at FACT, um, one of our partnering venues. And we have Belinda Kazim Kaminsky, Zua called Respire and Openings that um, is, you know, one of our commissioned works uh, where Belinda worked with, a, came to Liverpool several times to also work with a group of women here um, who work with their voices and breathing. And so this work specifically engages with the precarity of Black breath and the aspiration and inspiration to keep breath in the Black body. The work here creates a meditative and safe space for Black breath and what Belinda um, calls breath gatherers when referring to the individuals that she invited to instigate the space of collective breathing that considers whether Black liberation could start with breathing in and out deeply. This quiet and quotidian, quotidian gesture in, um, insisting on the capacity of the lungs in black beings keeping breath in the black body. Belinda writes, um, I like what Belinda writes where, where she says, the realization that one has been holding one's breath for another day of navigating whiteness as a structure, I think is an important way of thinking about Belinda's work outside of thinking about the precarity of black breath to think like what is standing in parallel to that is this having to negotiate whiteness as a structure that privileges white people in the world. And so I, I think that this intersection between the moving image, sound, sampling of Curtis Mayfield's song, Keep Keeping On, collaboration with local musicians who centralize breath in their work becomes this moment that conjures respire and openings, that conjures the, the, the capacity of our lungs to to fill themselves with the air, but at the same time to release um, the air. And I think this is one of the works that speaks in such a beautiful and poetic way to, to Umoya, really considering Umoya as an energy, um, as a portal, but also as this vital um, movement within our own bodies. Um, uh, Belinda was the only artist at fact, so. Um, and then we move to Open Eye Gallery, another partnering venue. And there we have Sandra Subi um, as the grounding artist um, and the work um, Samba Gown, which is a work from 2001, but also we commissioned um, Sandra to do a series of photographs or a procession in, in, in Uganda and, and film that procession as a part of um, 
showing us or sharing with us what you know why this the samba gown was made and the context in which it was made in and what it is negotiating in its geographical location and here we see um sandra using the institution of heteronormative marriage as a way to think through climate justice to think to think through um, colonial legacy in the forms of colonies that have been that have inherited governing systems that continue to disenfranchise the communities in uganda women and to think through women and invisible labor thinking of domestic labor and public labor and africa being the dumping site for european and western west waste with thinking here of electronic waste um clothing and plastic and i think it's quite an interesting thing to to think to to work with Sandra Subi as the grounding artist in, in Open Eye, because the other two artists, um, David Aguashero um, from um, Mozambique, um, did this work in, in, in 2018 called Takeaway that also looks at this sort of histories of extractions in, 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 um, in Mozambique around oil and around oil, around um, uh, sea life, and what that means for the indigenous practices of the people in Mozambique. Um, and then we would have Rahima Gambo, who, I mean, I, I, it's one of um, the works I really love because there's a lot of play in, in this nest works and wonder lines and instruments of air and how this um, play with thinking around site, thinking around land, thinking around um, other ecosystems that uh, we as humans share site and geographical locations and, and, and air. And thinking around also play, this idea of walking and you know, walking as part of play, as part of wandering, as part of imagination. And really um, a way of um, doing a, a landscaping survey of like um, taking account and keeping record of like, what do we have here and what have we inherited and how can we um, uh, coexist and find ways of, um, existing together and I think this work does that a lot and so at open eye we have these uh, three young young African practitioners young and they practice but also who are thinking around and imagining about how can we imagine ourselves into existence in the context of Africa and I think that's quite important to think about and then um, at uh, Tate Liverpool um, which is also one of our um, partnering venues. We have Dokwasa Dyson as the grounding artist with the work Liquid A Place that was produced in, in, in 2021. Um, this, has, this is one of our big projects that also required quite a lot from us in, institutionally as a biennial partnering with Tate and figuring out because of the scale of the work, how do we install, like how do we really take care of this work um, uh, so Dokwasa's practice um, engages with black and human geographies as a rubric. Um, and Dokwasa is interested in abstraction and ideas of distance and ways of looking out. And as you can see in, in this um, in liquid place that you get the sense of looking out um, into the horizon and into, into another worldly space. It also en engages water as a location and as a condition of state of continuous state change. Um, thinking through drawing and writing and scale, um, Dokwasa uses architecture and texture and the body as a way to try to induce affect in the moment. Um, Dokwasa writes that, and these forms are a meditation on the 70% of water our bodies are made of. And this liquids in endable connection of water-based infrastructures and architectures experience across time and space. The work was made examining the history of canals and docks following the river Thames in, Thames in, in London and thinking about humans who have been transported through colonization, empire and triangle trade. These brutal histories, these bu brutal histories hold waterways, extractions, capital, thoroughways and enclosures. I put in relation to current climate catastrophes and changing um, biospheres. So I think Dogwasa's work asks questions that centralize water through scale and abstractions of forms. So if you are thinking about um, the Dorf No Return, 
um, in West Africa, in Ghana, or if you're thinking about um, the hold of the boat, or if you're thinking about the, um, the hold in the dock as you enter into the dock. So this, this um, and the, you know, the triangular, the triangular trade. So these are all sort of, you can see it in these forms, these abstractions that she's made into this large scale, thinking also through, in the Liverpool context, the docks at the Tate, thinking through the architecture of the city, thinking through this, um, the choreography that happens in the city and how we move through the street names. And really, I think what um, Dokwasa has been able to do here as well is like really thinking about um, black blackness and black beingness and black geographies through these surfaces, you know, like if you touch, if you were to touch the work and the work specifically inside the triangle, there's this um, mirror reflection, which I'm quite, I'm still thinking through that, like why has Dokwasa Dyson put this reflective um, surface onto this object. So what are we, what, what is she instigating? What are we supposed to see? What, are, what is she asking me to see and think about? Um, and alongside that, of course, I mean, there are many artists at Tate. One of them is Guadalupe Maravilla with, dis, with disease throwers. And, um, and there's also work by um, Issa de Rosario um, from Brazil, with, which these works are, this is one work of I think six Orisha, um, Orisha works that represent the Orishas. Um, and at the Tate, you know, I you know, wanted to think through both the, the catastrophe and the liveness, to think both around the wound and ways to, to, to hold and tend to the wound and how we can move through that towards some form of remedy. And so this is sort of the idea we're thinking about um, cosmologies, we're thinking about um, rituals, ancestral rituals, we're thinking about um, what now um, I've been introduced as sort of trans-Indigenous ways of seeing and thinking and this conversation between these um, geographical locations, people from different geographical locations that share a history through the water are now in conversation with each other at Tate and I mean obviously across the entire biennial. Um, and then we have um, Albert Iboke Koza is a grounding artist at Tobacco Warehouse, which is our hub for this year's biennial. Um, and Tobacco Warehouse was built in 18, is it 18? It's a little later than that. So it's it was, a little, yeah. Mm, um, but it's sort of 19th century building yes. that housed, um, that stored like sort of tobacco and was an important central building in sort of thinking around tobacco itself and the storing of tobacco and receiving and then sort of disseminating it across, um, across Europe and the Americas. But also it is one of the largest brick buildings, historical buildings here and in the world. Um, and so it's an important site to think through. And here we have Albert, um, Albert Ipoca Cosa with um, their work, The Black Circus of the Republic of, of Bantu which is a continuous work and we've commissioned, this is also another big work we've commissioned and really uh, Iboke works from a sort of um, theater, theater background. And here we work together to push their, their practice further into sort of um, a constellation of all the things they work with in, in, in their work. And in this particular work, Iboke examines the history of human zoos in the West and in Europe, and the continuing violent and continuing violence of the white gaze, and what is what I find quite Im important in in Ibokos work is how they centralize the body as the site of memory, as meditation, as inquiry, and also most importantly as self reconciliation. Having to, um, it is quite hard, I think, and very challenging for artists who are thinking through these um, violent encounters and violent histories and doing so without having to subvert, you know? And because subversion also means that you need to violate yourself to show the extent of violence that has been done to you. And I think what Albert does so eloquently in this work is to move through this, 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 these histories of extractions and violence, to move through this trauma and to tend to it in a way that does not violate them and their ancestors. This work also draws a lot because um, Ibokwe is a Sangoma, which is an indigenous um, ancestral healer in Southern African context. 
Um, so it draws a lot also from that. In one of our conversations, um, they say that, you know, when you're a Sangoma, you have um, a space back home where you do all your consultations for people who are having spiritual and ancestral um, challenges. And they said something that I found quite interesting was that they said they cannot separate. There isn't a separation for them between the work that we see them do in the public space and in Dumba is called like where they do this, um, these, the, the ancestral spiritual consultations. And I think that is quite um, a gift to us that they come into the space, bringing all of that with them, this ancestral, spiritual, indigenous knowledge and find a way to communicate. Um, what is also quite important in this work is um, the looking at migration, um, both this forced migration through slavery, um, enslavement and colonialism, but also the current migration that is happening and how, again, so many black bodies are black and brown bodies, uh, black and brown beings are being reduced to black bodies drowning at sea, again, being completely erased. And so in this work, Ipokwe tends to that, tends to and say, as a way to Ukotusa, to take home, um, one of the things that they quite um, sensitive about is how do we hold the spirits um, that, yeah, that die at sea, that lose their lives at sea, how do we hold that spirits with care and tenderness? So other works alongside that is Pinta Dew's work, Chorus of Soil, um, that is um, one to one scale, almost to scale of the Brooks ship, um, Brooks ship that left, that was one of the fundamental ships that moved in and out of the Liverpool docks, transporting um, enslaved people and um, uh, goods extracted from the different um, geographical locations. And here Binta does this work as one, a, a memory, a commemoration, um, but also as a site of mourning, you know, mourning all those lives that have died at sea and asking questions around like, can we use these, these souls, this, this moment as a way to, as a, in a generative way, as to think about the plantation and to think about the plantation and the slave boat um, as a seeding into something else being possible. And this is why also there's like all these, um, um, what do you call these um, my, my brain just- The seedlings? The these seedlings, seeds. yes. And this is why these seedlings are also important in thinking about Binta's work. And I think this is an important work because also as black people who are descendants of people who have been enslaved and colonized, the world denies us our right to mourn by denying the, the genocide that has happened through colonialism and slavery. Um, and then we've got um, Julien Cruzet's work, which um, is really, I, I, yeah, is a poem in so many ways. And Julian, you know, thinks about um, form as well, the body as a space of um, articulating and experimenting and sort of shaping, using like making shapes and making objects, emulating the body in conversation with the body. But here in this work, he also looks into um, objects that have been looted out of, um, the Caribbean and African different islands into the museum and engages with them through like a soundscape and the formations of these objects. Again, I feel like this work is another way of sending souls home and saying, come, we will gather you, we are attending to you. And if you look carefully through this image behind there, there's a painting um, by Rahma Ramzi um, who looks at, um, uh, what is this plant? I forgot this plan, but basically um, Rahma's work looks at um, uh, the, the, con the, the violence and the tension between Israel and Palestine and what that has to do with um, uh, um, uh, parks, like you know, public parks and how those spaces, these spaces that are supposed to be communal and community are used as ways to demarcate and also to, um, to shrink to shrink, to shrink communities into specific ways of thinking and specific ways of moving and ordering their movements around the cities. Yes. <laughs> and then here 
at um, Victoria Gallery and Museum, which is another partner venue, we have a work by Shamane Watkins called Witness. And this work, this work also is one of the works we've also, um, it's like a, an existing work alongside a work commissioned by the Biennial. Um, you know, Shamane's practice is quite interesting and, you know, it was the first time they had made a sculptural piece, which for us is a huge thing. The sculptural piece you see in the middle that is meant to, you know, draw us as the people who attend, um, who go and see this work <clears throat> into the space of meditation, into the space of like, to just have a moment and to sit in the work. Um, in this work in witness uh, and, and in their practice, um, Charmaine centralizes women and what survives the crossing. Um, and also thinks about resistance to food. We think about recipes, spices, herbs, medicinal remedies. This work speaks of this indigenous knowledge, the knowledge which made the journey across the transatlantic along the enslaved and the knowledge shared between the African and the indigenous people of, of the Caribbean. And this is an important point that Charmaine makes because I think when we talk about the Caribbean, we never, we hardly or barely think about the indigenous people in the in the Caribbean context and this con and this um, intersection between the African, the enslaved Africans and the indigenous people in the Caribbean. What I also find fascinating about um, Charmaine's practice is this self-portraiture, but also sort of this ancestral. Um, tracing of herself by continuously continuously redrawing and drawing herself through um, the visions that she has of the women who come to her who look exactly like her and I think that's quite a powerful way of um, creating a space and also to say witness because I think a lot of us black people um, globally in the diasporas feel that our lives are not witnessed because there's this continuous erasure. And so this way of witnessing oneself into existence, but also ancestrally witnessing oneself as, you know, um, in our conversations with Shemaine, like I know that this work came as a vision, it was delivered. And this witnessing, um, ancestral witnessing, I think is quite an important aspect in Shemaine's work. Alongside Shemaine's work, we have Antonio Oba's Jardim and Fela Porras Kim's work, Future, Future Spaces Replicate Earlier Spaces. Um, and there's this beautiful synergy that happens between these works, between um, Antonio and Gala's work, sitting and holding um, space with uh, Shemaine's work and Shemaine being the, the, the grounding artist that really situates and holds and positions these other two works. Um, and then at World Museum, we have um, Galaporas Kim's work called Roll Call. This is one of the works that is very difficult for me to speak about um, because this work looks at uh, Egyptian um, mummies that have been violently extracted by the British and bought, brought into museums. And I mean, there's, there's so many levels of um, injustice, so many levels of disrespect, so many levels of like insensitivity to people's cultures in lieu of like, you know, building a museum. And so what Gala does in their practice is really look into sort of um, museum collections and museum archives and ask questions around um, the keeping of these objects the, and the why, why are these objects here, why are they kept here, how are they kept. And this roll call in this work, um, Gala does this um, beautiful um, acknowledgement of how uh, these people wanted to be remembered and so calls out their names you know, and echoes their names. And so as you enter the World Museum in the foyer, the first, one of the first things you hear are the names being said in this um, sensitive, caring, tender way. Still very difficult for me to speak about this work because at the World Museum, the actual mummies, they're like, I mean, I, I couldn't bring myself to really spend a lot of time there. So it's still a work that I'm, that is working me um, and asking me questions around how do I as a curator um, really care and create and, and, and instigate spaces for a curing to happen. How does one hold um, such a work? Um, I'm still grappling with that. Um, 
Yeah. And then in the public realm, in the public realm, we have about six works and Elaine Luluan is the grounding artist with their work called um, Geli Balibade. I still not pronouncing that right. I'm still processing that, which means to the last myth. Um, this word means a process of transitioning from one state to another through ritual. Um, this draws from um, Elaine's uh, tribe, the Rukai nation in, in Taiwan. And such a generous offer. This, this work that we are looking at right now is a, a, um, a, a Elaine, Elaine has taken this um, sacred ancestral part to her family, to her nation, and gifted us in the biennial uh, a three feet tall um, version of the part that is opened up. This part is a sacred part because in, in the Rukai nation, there is a story about how the founder of the Rukai nation came through the pot from the ocean, from the water, from the river water, and emerged from this pot. And so, and this pot has two snakes on um, a snake on both sides that protects the Rukai nation and protected the founder of the Rukai nation. And so, for me, I mean, it's it's also one of the words that I'm still trying to figure out. How do I speak about such a sacred ancestral um, offering done by Ilang, where she's you know, offering the biennial and the public to the sacred object of her people and saying, you can engage with this object. And on top of that, she engages with like um, the history of maritime and also engages with the ecology and engages with um, the, what the legacy, the colonial legacy of environmental um, devastation. And so this work is like, it's quite layered, but what Elaine is asking us to do is to think through the indigenous offering as a way, as a, as a, as a, as a, possible, as a possibility for us to, to engage with our current catastrophe when it comes to like climate, climate justice. Um, and then, our final, the final work I'll speak about is this digital commission, um, a work by Katitaya Katitu Tayasu, which is called Green Star. And we've commissioned this work, um, which is Katitaya made this um, soundscape uh, dedica dedicated specifically to Umoya and dedicated to Liverpool and thinking around Liverpool as a city and the, 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 the energies and spirits that have moved here the catastrophe that has happened, the imagination that has happened and how the city was imagined into existence through these um, colonial and slavery roots, but also um, as a way to offer um, a moment of meditation around the city as the idea of this work is that as you move through the city from one venue to the next, you can listen to Green Star as a way to lead you, as a way to hold you from one space to the next. I think, I have said enough. Yeah, and that's a wrap, folks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And as you can see, there are many artists that we didn't have a chance to talk about. Um, and we'd 
I guess this is a moment really just to thank them also for their participation and how they've contributed to Umoya. And of course, we're happy to answer any questions about those works as well, those really wonderful works. But yeah, we'll, we'll finish there. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kensle, and uh, thank you, Sam. I think it really gave uh, uh, a holistic way, a holistic sense of how you approached the, how you approached the project, uh, how you dealt with some of the some of the topics that um, I think also probably naturally come out when you face a city like Liverpool that has a very specific uh, uh, history, a very specific past that uh, um, that even myself when I was living there was was facing, and it. it had a very bodily even uh, uh, effect on me when I was thinking of the warehouses, when I was thinking of the history of, of the spaces. Um, and so maybe I can I can start from this um, and and pose a very quick question myself, quick, I don't know, but a question myself to start a conversation, um, which which has to do with this, which has to do with your encounter uh with liverpool and its uh its names its uh buildings its uh um i mean you did mention uh that also uh natural elements came in no when you talk about the wind when you talked about uh how this influenced uh, or um, mm. yeah, impacted you um <clears throat> but I, as i was saying i really remember when i was living there almost really feeling this feeling the history present and feeling the scars that were left in in the, in the city and uh, I was wondering how all of this um, played into your curatorial approach especially given the importance that you give to to bodily elements to to sensations and, and, and so on uh, I know you talked about it a little bit but I, I actually thought about it very much also in relation with your description or of uh, Turquoise Dyson's uh, work at Tate, which I think goes a good distance in this sense. Um, so yeah, I, I just wondering. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more of of how this first and probably continuous encounter with this history uh, influenced your 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 fundamental approach to the project. Let's say. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, I mean, when I, when I accepted this, this gig, I had never been to, to Liverpool before. Um, I hadn't been to the British side, I'd been to like Scotland and stuff. And so um, I didn't know, you know, like I didn't know like much specifically about the history here. And so I came here uh, as an unknowing person. That's how I approach everything as a curator. Like, as an, like I don't know, and this is why um, I curate, like out of like, you know, the, the one curiosity, curiosity, but also like a deep interest and in love for people and a deep interest and in love for black people, queer people, brown people, poor people, um, disenfranchised people. And like, how do we survive this? How do we not only survive this capitalist system, but how do we make life in this continuous economic duress? Um, and so I, I came here not knowing what I will find at all. Um, and so my approach was to first um, speak to the people who've been doing things here. Like, so all the partner venues, I, I went to them. And I've asked them to tell me about themselves and what they do and how they see themselves fit into the biennial, um, because I wanted to, to have a sense of awareness of who I was working with, what are they willing to hold, how much can they hold, because care, you know, like how, how do I ask someone to care when I have no awareness of what they are interested in, what draws them, um, what capacity do they have, what is their curiosity about the place they're in, what is the intention with the organization they're running? So those things are the, like for me was the first thing of like, okay, where am I? Who who's who's moving here and how are they moving? Um, and then you know, which I I call like um, listening, you know, um, forensic listening and ancestral listening. The forensic listening is really mapping out, you know, 
what the city is made of in terms of the organizations I can work with. Um, and then the ancestral listening is then to listen to the city itself, you know, to listen to um, the street names, the architecture, the sound the city makes uh, during, during different times, like who gets to be at the center of the city, like and what do they do when they're at the center, at what times, like which bodies are moving at what time. So really listening ancestrally and then listening to how the city vibrates, you know, which I call like the choreography of the city, how the city moves itself. And that has to do with the natural element, like what is the weather like? How does that weather affect the moods of the people and how people order themselves around? Um, the wind, you know, became an important aspect of that. Um, also coming from Cape Town, you know, a very windy city. I was like, ah, I'm, I'm used to the wind, but no, I was not prepared for the wind in Liverpool. Um, but also because in Cape Town, we have the southeasterly wind that happens between September and November. That is harsh, that blows people where you have to hold on to things, but it doesn't have, it doesn't hit you on the bone. And the wind here like, you know, moves through all the layers and onto the bone. And I think that was the first moment of ancestral listening where I was facing myself I made the decision to come here. I accepted an invitation. I had the capacity to buy things, to layer myself, yet this wind has found a way to move through all of that and found spots to hit me to the bone, which then made me think and feel like the somatic response of like, and I wonder, I wonder what my people who were brought here violently felt when they came here. I wonder, in those linens and the, the kind of things we wear at home. I wonder, I wonder how a person whose body is in a state of hyper duress feels this wind. When I layered, it hits me to the bone. Like what happens when it hits them to the bone? So that was, you know, like ancestral listening. If that's how I can sort of share that. Um, so that, that was the first layers. And the other layer was like, um, getting a tour um, with a historian who has been working here for the last 20 years, like tracing the history of the city and listening to someone who is holding um, all of that, who's been holding all of that for 20 years and like making sense and making links and moving through the city and like listening to all these the stories and having been made aware of, you know, the link between, um, the street name and the architecture of the building, um, being made aware of the, the, the merchant um, and how they build the, the, and how Liverpool was important in the industrialization of the docks, you know, and what that meant for, for their economy, you know, and how they imagined the city. But I think one of the most challenging and heavy realizations during that process was realizing that ordinary people like myself were for slavery, were for colonization, because whatever, whatever justification they gave themselves. And then to then take that and be like, and so what does it mean for the contemporary white person? If everyday people, a shoemaker, a barber, a, a baker, you know, supported slavery, then no one, in this timeline can say to me, I have no link to slavery or colonialism, like my family did it. I'm like, no, we have to, you know? And so that was a very hard, cause I was like, then this is the conversation I need to start having with people that like, you may say you are not linked to slavery and your family, but actually that is not historically correct. And so, so, so that was the first layer, which was very challenging actually to that, you know, and also this, that imagination that I've been for all these years working with imagination as this positive good thing, working with the light of imagination and then realizing that like people sat down here and imagined slavery and colonialism and then manifested it. The dark, the dark side of imagination is also like that imagination can holster violence and brutality and, you know, and genocide, which colonization and slavery is still not recognized as a genocide. And you know, that that, like that this refusal from the world to recognize genocide of black people that continues 
into this moment is a very challenging thing also to sort of figure out how do I care for that, care for the descendants of the enslaved and colonized? How do I, you know, um, instigate or a curing to happen? How do we co-create the space to hold all of these? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the for the explanation. I think it gives yeah it gives a sense of the complexity of this of this first encounter and and, and so on. Um, I was just reaching out to Emily Rose who had uh, uh, sent us a, a question beforehand, um, and I'm just waiting to uh, hear from her if she wants to pose it herself. Otherwise, I'm more than happy to read it for her. Um, I think I'll just go ahead and pose the question. Yeah, you can sure. interview. Um, and she was asking, uh, how does a relational ethics of care inform your curatorial practice? Hmm. Um, I think I sort of answered that a little bit, no? Um, I think, you know, right now, um, care, this word has become the word in the art world. Um, I've been working with care for a very long time, trying to understand like, what, what do I mean? Um, how does a curator care? Um, because I feel like as a curator, I'm a custodian in a way um, of the things that I do. Like I own nothing, but I'm a custodian, right? Um, and custodianship means to care for, for for the thing that you're doing. And then I was like, well, we need to break down care, like what we mean. So I was like, okay, so if I'm invited by the Liverpool Biennial, um, I need to have an awareness and know what their care ethic is. And not as a, as a theoretical, beautiful slogan written somewhere, like what is it in practice? Like what is it as an institutional, bureaucratic, systematic, how does that work? How do they enact it? And so that it's not a performative thing of like, I see you, um, you are heard here. We value your opinion. Like, not that, because that can be very performative and performative care is very violent. But what does it mean like for the structure of the organization to, to instill a, 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 an ethic of care? So um, I made it quite clear, for instance, to the biennial, like, my care needs that I'm not here just as a curator. I am here. If you are inviting me, you have to invite all of me. I'm I'm a mother, I'm a sangoma, um, I'm a full parent, I'm a sibling, I'm a daughter, I'm part of the queer community, like I'm part of the black community. And so you need to figure out how to care for all those parts of who I am and pay attention to the things that I need. Um, and then vice versa, I need to figure out how to care for the team that I work with and like what, what those needs are. Um, so that's one layer, which then gives me sort of um, a, a rubric of like how care can be facilitated for the people that I have to invite because the people I invite are trusting me. And you know, if, they, if they're trusting me, I need to ensure to the best of my capacity how they are handled and cared for. And so when I invite artists, I think about you know, care for the artist as the artist as a person care for their work, care for their narrative. Um, and that also has to do like where we put their work, you know, that the space we put their work in has to be able to hold the work, hold it um, technically, hold it conceptually, hold if it has a spiritual and an ancestral element, they need to be able to hold that. Um, and so, and that's where the curing comes in that, you know, instigating a space for a curing to happen. The idea is that, when the artist's work um, reaches the, the, the location, it does what it needs to do and not having to negotiate the politics and the system of the space. That is what I have to do in preparing the space to welcome and receive the work. And so that's how you know, I work with Care and Cure, which of course means that I also have to ask questions from the artist, like how do you need to be care for what are the things that are important to you? Um, and it's different for all artists. And then communicate that with the people I'm, I'm working with, but also communicate 
with the artist and people are with like my capacity to care because the capacity is not as wide as it may seem. Um, care also means that like you make mistakes, you don't always get it right. And when you do, you have to get over your ego and acknowledge, apologize and ask, how can I do it? How do you need me to do it? And, and capacity is such an important thing. I know this is another word right now, like moving around, but in practice, you know, to, in order to be able to have capacity, you need to also communicate to say, this is my limitation. This is as far as I go. This is how much I can hold so that the person you're caring for is aware, you know, that you also need care. So that's, um, that has been my approach and it's, you know, constantly evolving as, um, because situations and conditions and circumstances change, which means that I need to constantly um, be nimble I need to be nimble all the time to the shifting conditions, the shifting feeling. Um, yeah. Care as an as not a transactional thing, but care as um, truly giving and generative force that we can use between each other. Sam, can I turn part of the question to you? Because of course sure. this was a dialogue uh, I, between. It's a it's something we were thinking of already. So as an organization, as you said, I joined just previous to the, to the last biennial in the middle of a pandemic. And I came not from a festival or a biennial background. So started thinking about the structural framework of biennial making and how in some ways it's very exclusionary. It doesn't give much space for care. It has um, a temporal kind of rhythm to it that is very fast. That's about working with many people simultaneously about trying to balance that capacity that Kenny C. Labour was talking about with um, conflicting demands. And then thinking about who, you know, who could, how could we work as a biennial differently following our experiences of working during a pandemic um, and how we could care more as an organization um, and there are some you know some of those capacity things are to do with finances they're to do with our financial capacity but what, what I always think is that what we do have the capacity to think about is how we work as people with people. And um, we, we can't, there's so many things that are outside our control structurally within the way that a festival works. So inviting Kamisile to um, work with us, um, I don't think it, I don't know. I don't know, it seems like a yesterday and a hundred <laughs> years ago, but it was, I think, part of a desire to think about working differently. And I knew for sure that I wanted, or I wanted us as an organization to work with someone who would bring different ways of thinking and challenge us in that. Um, in terms of thinking about care with Kenesile, as she describes, we've worked really hard to think about capacity, to think about how we hold the artists and each other, and to acknowledge where we haven't got it right, um, because that has happened. But to do that without um, recrimination or um, with a kind of ease to it has been um, something that I have learned along the way and that ease to be directed towards ourselves as well as a way of um, working with care um, across our biennial. <clears throat> Seems like, uh, yeah, very probably complex, but very positive trajectory of growth, I think, for, for the dialogue and for the discussion. Um, I wanted to go back to the presentation very briefly. And uh, you mentioned the importance of the grounding artists for each venue. And uh, as we have two of them present in the, in the chat with Sepide Raha and, and Sandra Subi, I also wanted to ask if they wanted to 
to join the conversation. Uh, my question to, to you from a curatorial perspective would have been uh, if you can give us uh, a bit more of an insight uh, into how the conversation developed between yourself and them as these um, key artists, let's say, within each venue. Um, but given that they're present, I would also, of course, love to hear their experience and their uh, and their insights. If yeah, they're here. I mean, I think they should speak. It's, I think, yeah, as people who have been part of the process, I think it's better for them. To hear from it'd be nice to hear from them what they think. Deputy Sandra, do you hear us? Hello, hi. Yes, I do. <laughs> ah, wow. <laughs> I I I think for me, um I always continue to tell Camusilla that this has been a very rewarding, rewarding um, experience altogether. I think that, uh, yeah, there's that statement that's always just to hold, like just, I think I was here thinking about how a word I could use, <laughs> and I was thinking about the word home, and I really love that you spoke about it um, with such, yeah, like with such detail, um, and really the fact that I think for me that one of the things that was very special is that even with the whole biennial team, we, or was it, I, I mean, the first meeting we had, I broke down and cried <laughs> because it was too, it was like, a, an, it was unreal. Like you, there was so much, um, it was very genuine. Um, for me as well, it was, a, it was a very interesting space because it felt safe for me to also unlearn and learn again, because many times when you make um, a work and you you and it's out there, it's sometimes I mean it has originated from you, but it starts to take on its own life. And so for me, this has really been a journey of um, I guess listening to the work as well, because in Uganda it says a number of things. I haven't I haven't been to Liverpool to really experience what it feels like there. But when I see how people are responding to it, I man, it's just a very um I guess I, I you you take you take what is it like a, a, a moment to really allow it to tell you what it's saying. And so for me, I I must say it has just been a very rewarding experience, um, a very humbling experience, um, particularly to speak about it like grounding at the Open Eyes Gallery. That also was very, <laughs> very lovely to learn today. Um, yeah, so I think, I think I can just say that for me, the work, Samba Gown, it really does center women in this conversation um, and really speaking from or speaking through something or a conversation or I guess should I say um, an experience which many times we are we are defined by but many times it touches on so many things that influence us and end up making us I guess who we are and so I think for me it has been an opportunity to, to ask more questions to myself um, in my own space and to really, I guess, listen, should I say. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm still on that journey. There was a, 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 a bit of the, of the project where we worked with amazing women from Rule of Thirds and uh, the Stitch Club, and they too just brought a whole other layer to the work that honestly, I feel like I'm, I'm privileged to be privy to. So I'm grateful for the fact that we, sometimes, you know, you make a work and it feels like you've made it and there it is. But I think what has happened with this biennial and the process, not the work that you see at the end, is that there's so much care to that process. So, so many things could be back you know, from that. And for me as a creative, as a 
as a woman, as a Ugandan woman. What a joy, what a, what a lovely experience to learn, to unlearn, to listen. Yeah, and just be in the company of such amazing minds. So I think we're still on this journey of, of, of learning here. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes, I decided to join because I have a baby sleeping here. <laughs> Thank you so much for this really touching um, um, presenting and sharing because I haven't had a chance yet to come and visit Liverpool, the biennial. And I want to say personally, I am really touched. I feel really honored to be part of this biennial that you curated and also so potential in my <laughs> ongoing process because maybe I can share this that I was in Iran. It was August last year and I was um, arranging to work with women in the paddy lands, uh, which is like my grandpa's land that he passed. He lived over a hundred years and then gave that heritage to my father and then to his siblings as well. And <laughs> I was just uh, preparing myself and then we had this meeting and I want to say that uh, until today, I have been sharing this also with my colleagues in, in here in Finland, that um, to meet you. And then the first thing you asked, you said that I don't want to see your work. I want to know who you are. And that was the best, amazing approach for the first time. I want to confess, I have met many curators from all corners, <laughs> corner of this uh, small planet. And you were the only person who said, you want to know who I am? What is my position in relation to what I do? and to way that I am living. And that, that really stayed with me because I always positioned myself, always in my entire life. <laughs> and it really was uh, touching. And I, did, I didn't think that I will be part of this biennial, but still the, your approach that you really were interested and curious to know who I am as an artist. And that really, I had maybe 25 minutes conversation with you, but it really was amazing. And a week after I realized I am pregnant. And this was my first ever experience in my life. And also the follow-up conversations that we had, it really, really helped me to look back at the process that I was engaged with to make my work. Also the matter of like caring for a, for a, for a human being inside me, for a new being. And at the same time, women were putting seeds and this fragile plant of rice in the ground and then singing to it their pain because the language is uh, not uh, is Mozani and it's not, uh, one of, is not recognized in Iran. And most people don't understand even one, why, what they are singing. They are singing their struggles, day-to-day -day struggle to the land with the hope of the growth. And in the end, the rice from 50 kilos of rice grain, my father um, cultivated a ton, thousand kilos of rice for the first time. And this is, I want to say, I want to share that this is the beauty of this process that will stay for the rest of my life, making this project and having the honor to present it in Liverpool and at the same time, some part of it in Helsinki, but I, I guess Liverpool is more wider with the viewers coming from all, all parts of the globe. So yeah, this, this caring, I felt that I have been cared for during the process. There was a little bit in the beginning, of course, there was this time with this long distance communication. But um, towards the end, I was, I'm very happy and really satisfied. And I cannot wait to come and see the other artists' works because when I read one of the reviews, it really, you know, that you made such a, such a, a juxtaposition of different practices and works that really speak to the history of the city. And my work also, of course, the geographically it's located in Iran, but the new colonial politics are really affecting a still the world. It's not colonial, we are not talking about the past, we are talking about the present. How does mm -hmm. it affect the small farmers? Because if we, even we think about the climate change and the global crisis with the environment, we need to really focus on the envi environment that local farmers are working, not the corporations in the... I mean, this is also maybe one part that I was caring about with my project that Yes, women are singing, and this rice travels from northern Iran to Finland, 
to Northern Europe, and I'm pretty sure to UK and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And it is fascinating because the process, this lengthy process comes with a lot of care and maintenance and a lot of the politics with the grain that is genetically manipulated, sadly. And it also, a lot of grains because of the global warming cannot uh, tolerate uh, the change in the environment. But this grain lasts more than a hundred years. So this is very also important without any manipulation or change mm -hmm. in the genetics. But yeah, I just wanted to say that thank you so much, both of you for having me. And I can't wait to come and see you in person. And hopefully <laughs> I have been overwhelmed that so many people really related to my work and they have been tagging me and sharing, commenting and sharing personal messages with me that they really liked it because it's a simple matter, right? Cultivation of a, of a grain that comes to yeah. our plate. And most of people, including myself, were not aware of how is the process, for instance, geographically in Iran. I'm sure there are different ways of cultivation. Mm -hmm. But then they were affected that, oh, this is really different, like different layers are in it. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you to you too and you, Sandra. Thank you both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I extend some thanks also from, from our sides. It's uh, it's always special to hear also like directly from the artist their their experience and their uh, yeah. yeah their process and their emotional process behind participating in such an event. Um, I've written down many more questions, but I'm looking up at the time, and I think we're kind of already half an hour over what we had mm. <laughs> agreed to. Uh, so instead of, um, of, of posing the other three or four questions at the head, um, I wanted to do one round very quickly to check if there is any more questions from, from the audience, um, just to give everybody the possibility of intervening. Um, and as far as I see, there is no raised hand or anything. Uh, so yeah, I would really, really like to thank you for for this. It was, uh, as as also Sapide said, it it was a very touching um, edition of IBS stage. Uh, I'm sure it's something that translates strongly also to the to the biennial as a whole and to the works. And uh, I wish I had the possibility of coming. I hope many of our of our viewers and our members will be able to pass. Um, there is a thanks from Ryan Hughes from the Coventry Biennial, um, yeah. and uh, he also thanks for the talk, uh, yeah, in general. Um, yeah, I, I think with this we can slowly go towards uh, a closing of the, of the event. I just want to remind everyone that the, the event is being recorded as well and will be uploaded to our uh, website and YouTube channel and so on in a few days time. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for your presentation, for your, for your uh, words and time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, of course, for future events, uh, you can uh, keep following our uh, social media networks, uh, our websites, um, and uh, we look forward to having many of you with us again uh, for the next IBS stage. Thank you very much. <laughs>